Good evening, and welcome to Open Book, Open Mind Online, Montclair Public Library's um, live author conversation series. Um, and tonight we're hosting Jeremy Peters talking about his timely new book, Insurgency, How Republicans Lost Their Party and Got Everything They Ever Wanted. I'm Ariel Zeitlin, one of the librarians at the Montclair Public Library. And first, I'd just like to draw your attention to the Q&A button. If you're using a computer or a smartphone, it's at the bottom of your screen. If you're using a tablet, it's at the top of your screen. That's how you can send us your questions for the Q&A. And it's also how you can ask for live tech help from my librarian co-host, Alex Russo, at any time during the webcast. Now I'd like to introduce Jason, Jason Tans, a member of the board of our Library Foundation. Welcome, Jason. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, hello, everyone. We're so happy that you're here for another virtual webcast of Open Book, Open Mind. I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of the Montclair Public Library Foundation. We're a group of your friends and neighbors, and our mission is to raise money to fund the offerings that make our library so special. That includes library programs like this one, staff development, building restoration, and other needs that aren't covered by city funding. So your donations support everything from laptop lending and Wi-Fi hotspots for Montclair residents without internet access, to lifelong learning classes, homework tutoring and resume help, to the children's reading programs, and most recently, the significant growth in e-content during, during the pandemic. So after you enjoy this event, please make a donation through our website, montclairplf.org. Gifts of all sizes have an impact and the library needs your support now more than ever. So thank you very much and please enjoy the program. Thank you so much for all that you do, Jason. And if anyone in the audience wants to contribute to the library in other ways, please search for Friends of the Montclair Public Library on our website or on Facebook. Now, I'm delighted to introduce our guest this evening, Jeremy Peters. Jeremy is a longtime New York Times reporter and an MSNBC contributor. Jeremy, is it too old fashioned to say that national politics is your beat? He's covered two presidential campaigns, the machinations on Capitol Hill, and also specializes in the intersection of politics and the news media. Jeremy lives in the New York area, and this is his first book. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you. Um, Insurgency was just published the day before yesterday, and it's already gotten a lot of attention. Um, Joe Scarborough of MSNBC called it a bracing account of how the party of Lincoln and Reagan was hijacked by gadflies and grifters who reshaped their movement into becoming an anti-democratic cancer that attacked the US Capitol. The book is available to buy at our program partner, Watch on Booksellers, and will soon be available to borrow through the library. Now, I'm also happy to introduce Jeremy's conversation partner, David Halpfinger, the political editor of the New York Times. In fact, David is Jeremy's editor at the paper, so this conversation might give us a glimpse of what it's like behind the scenes at the paper of record. David lives in Montclair. Welcome, David. Thanks for having me. Okay, so this is the moment we've all been waiting for. And for all of you at home, please remember <clears throat> that you can start submitting your questions while the conversation is going on. I'll be back later after the Q&A. Great, let's get started, Jeremy. Um, I'd like to begin with your subtitle. Um, Ariel read it to the group, but how Republicans lost their party and got everything they ever wanted. Could you just talk for a minute about what you meant by that? And who are the Republicans that you have in mind as having lost their party? Well, that's a great question. The, uh, it might be a little, little bit of writerly hyperbole, but you know, you wouldn't know anything about that, which you <laughs> the, the, yeah, they, no, the everything they ever wanted refers most to all Republicans, but, but most of all, the cornerstone of Donald Trump's political constituency, which is the evangelical Christians and the social right. Uh, they, I think, have benefited more than any 
group of Republicans, you have to look no further than the three conservative justices on the Supreme Court that Trump appointed. And I, I think that the, the reference to how they lost their party uh, is, is a it's more those establishment Republicans who are perfectly happy with getting most of what they wanted, if not everything um, in the form, not just of the Supreme Court, but uh, in terms of the, all the deregulations and tax cuts that Trump passed. Uh, but those establishment Republicans lost a party that they that, that they had never really had control of or never really realized that they didn't have full control of because as the other as the actual title says the history of the modern republican party is one of insurgency where revolt and upheaval from the right has destabilized the leadership yeah no it, it, it's interesting i was thinking of of people like eric Cantor and paul ryan who are kind of like the the bodies on the side of the road in this book, um, people who are run out of politics by the same forces that they helped unleash that you mm -hmm. described so well. Now Liz Cheney is kind of staring down that same barrel. I wonder if you think Mitch McConnell will be next. I actually think Mike Pence is going to be next, but we can we can leave that for another part. Oh no, we should come back to that. Yeah. And maybe you'll write that story. So you were you were working on this book, I think you said beginning in 2017. Yes, the end of 2017, right. What was your original idea going into it? And if you could, tell us how that was transformed during the 2020 campaign and its aftermath. So I was always obsessed with presidents when I was a kid. Uh, I was kind of a nerd and I would give press conferences in the family room that my parents would uh, pretend to videotape. And I had like, you know, these placemats uh, with all the presidents kind of circling around. And I thought of one of those placemats and what it would look like with Donald Trump's face on it and thought that a book needed to explain how he got there, because it's still going to be jarring for people 25 years from now to look at that placemat and see his face there after, you know, Clinton, Bush, Obama, and, and after, before Biden. Um, it's just nothing in our history uh, has ever been like Donald Trump. So I wanted this to be the book that is on the shelf for a long time to come that told people the answer to that question. Now, what we didn't really think through when we started writing the book was how it would end and, and end in a way that made sense to the reader. There were a lot of books that came out and, and in this period, and I felt, you know, they were all many of them were very, very good, but they kind of lopped off artificially at a certain point. Um, and we said, why end it in the middle of 2019 or wherever when you can extend it through 2020 and have an answer um, as, as to what Trump's impact was on the Republican Party throughout his presidency. So at least there was a, a period there, maybe in the end of a paragraph, maybe not the end of, of a chapter. In fact, I think this book is not the end of the story by any stretch of the imagination. Um, we're, we're somewhere in the middle. I don't know exactly where, but um, whether or not I, I want to write the uh, uh, the next book in in this series, I I, I don't I don't know <laughs> if I have the stomach for that right now. Yeah, but in effect, the ending that you got became a great beginning for you. It did because on election night, I remember talking to my my book editor. And I said, I think that we have the ideal ending because our fear was always that Trump was going to be irrelevant and then and people would be sick of him and no one would want to read a book about him a year after he's left office. Well, obviously that's not the case. I mean, if you turn on cable news, my God, it's like the guy is still president. They cover him more than they cover Biden. Um, and I so I, I said to my editor, I'm like, I actually think this is good because Trump is gone. He's defeated but he's still relevant and he's still the leader of the party. So uh, that's where we are today. And I guess that's a big question mark hanging over the party's future. I wanna go back a long way back to really where the book kind of takes its starting point. Pat Buchanan plays a really interesting role in your narrative. He also, I understand, provided some important source material to you. And his 92 presidential primary campaign is where you really begin your chronology of the modern GOP and its steady drift or lurch to the right. Why did you begin there? So 
you can always have this debate about how far back do you go. And I think my, my editor and I decided early on that if, if we weren't careful, we were going to be starting with Barry Goldwater, which is fine. Um, I, I, Barry Goldwater is a fascinating guy and many fascinating books have been written about him. But Buchanan was a contemporary figure. He was one that, that readers will certainly recognize and remember. I mean, I'm old enough to remember his campaigns for president. And I remember that fence he talked about. Um, and and I, it, it stuck with me as an image. Um, and his, his, just, his television presence was also very good because like Trump, and, and there's many ways he, he's like a proto-Trump figure, he was very good on TV and he, had, he could really captivate an audience. Um, he wasn't quite a pop culture figure like Trump. Um, he was more of an intellectual, but I thought I, I, I so I wanted to always talk to Buchanan and I never really had at length. So he, in, he invited me over once and I sat in his, his living room in McLean in this like mansion that he lives in behind the CIA headquarters. And you know how you do these interviews, David, where like you, you someone, your source says something and it's like an aha moment. And like, that's, the basis for the story that you're going to write. And what he said to me that, that was like that was he, on the night of the primary in California in 1992, when he was still running against Bush, he had no business being in the race anymore because he'd been, he, he was a dead man on the ballot, essentially. He wasn't going to, no way he was going to stop Bush. But he was looking at the returns coming in that night. And in LA County, San Diego County, and, uh, 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 Orange County, I believe, he was getting 30% of the vote still. And it was all about immigration. This was way more of the vote than he had he'd received in other recent primaries and in California, actually, overall. So that was that, that told him that what he was saying about immigration was really powerful uh, in a place that was experiencing it firsthand as a, as a real societal problem. So illegal immigration, that is, I should say. Yeah. So it wasn't just that, as, as I talked to him some more, he started shedding light on how his 92 campaign as, as, as like a pit, much of a pivot point as it was, is really kind of misunderstood and people misremember it because what actually got him into the race wasn't immigration or trade or any of these America first policies we associate with him. It was affirmative action. It was race-based. And there was this element of racial grievance, this anger that people who, you know, they, they were mad that their kids didn't get into the school that they that they thought they should get into and were blaming a minority that took their spot supposedly, or they were mad about having to press one for English on the phone. And that's what motivated Buchanan. And I thought that that really is not that far from where we are in politics today. So I made him the beginning point chronologically. I just wanted to ask you if I'm, I'm so curious to know what Buchanan thinks of what has happened to the Republican Party. Is he pleased? Does he, you know, I mean, is, is he just delighted with the way things are? Oh, yeah. He told me a story. And I forget if I put this in the book because some of the stuff makes like doesn't quite it hits the cutting room floor. Um, but he called Jeff Sessions after or no, Jeff Sessions called him after Trump won in 2016. And Buchanan said that, that they just laughed. Like, they're, oh my God, can you believe that we did this? Because the, you know, the ideas that they were talking about were never really accepted by the mainstream or the, you know, the establishment of, of the Republican Party in Washington. So he was delighted. He, I have to say, he didn't think Trump would win an, a, a, a second term, uh, which was interesting. And I asked him why. And it, his reason essentially was that he just didn't think that there were enough white voters left to elect him again. Yeah, he's, he, he and the Democrats thought that too, I guess, right? Um, so this week you've actually been covering Sarah Palin's libel suit against the Times. Um, in your book, she comes across as, as a major precursor, even a much bigger and more recent, obviously, pre precursor to Trump than, than Buchanan was. Somebody who instinctively grasped a lot of what he went on to exploit much more successfully. Was she just ahead of her time or, or did she lack something that Trump brought to the table? I think it's both actually. Um, she was ahead of her time because the Republican party at that point was still in a position of strength where it could kind of kill off those elements. Um, and, and with her, it did, it kind of, it kind of drove her, it, it personally, it really aggrieved her and, and 
and angered her uh, and I think um, really ruined her, ruined national politics for her as a passion. Um, I don't think she wanted to do it anymore and she didn't want to spend the time away from her family. But she, she was a figure ahead of her time because she had the grievance that Trump did, but she, it, she experienced it in a more authentic way. Trump's grievances for the most part are, are, are invented. Trump is, is somebody, a, a guy of extreme wealth and privilege who claims that his idea of being persecuted is Macy's canceling his line of ties uh, after he says that you know Mexicans are rapists, which he did at, at, after he announced uh, being president, and Macy's did too. And then the PGA pulled his tour and he was, oh my God, I'm so victimized. Um, her victimization was actually real. And it was, it was uh, a, a condescension that she felt that I think is, is actually legitimate. She was, she and the people, the, the area where she were, she's from were, were, you know, denigrated as quote, valley trash, uh, because it's this area of Alaska outside Anchorage. It's not very prosperous and it's kind of the Bible belt and it's, uh, they call it the Bible belt of Alaska. It's a little rednecky. Um, and they, you know, they resented that, but then she also was basically thrown, tossed around by the Republican establishment uh, in the state. Um, and, and she was disrespected by them. They tried to push her out of, uh, out of her leadership position um, on, a, on an important board in the state after she was mayor of Wasilla. Um, and she came back and she beat them. She beat the sitting Republican governor, Frank Murkowski. Um, and it was really a, a, a feat. Um, and she became the youngest person ever elected governor of Alaska, the only woman. And uh, so, yeah, she was, she's different than Trump in a lot of ways, but she's also, I think if you, you know, cause your question was, was she, was she ahead of her time? Did she lack something Trump have? She lacked the, the ambition. I think she lacked the grievance to get back at her enemies the way that Trump did. Trump was always trying to prove something and that drove him. And he just had more media savvy than she did. She always treated the media um, as if it were her enemy. And Trump did that, but he also never really believed it in the same way that she did. Like, yes, he'll claim the New York Times and all the mainstream media, like they hate yeah, him. He's taking Maggie's calls. So. Right, right, right. And he's inviting all of us down to Mar-a-Lago to talk to him, like for our books. I mean, it's, and sh she's not like that. So uh, yes. Gotcha. Um, another big character in the book is Roger Ailes, the late chairman and the founder of Fox News. Um, and, you know, he was an instrumental figure in the book and in the story of the GOP. He was out of the picture before Trump got elected, but you argue that he did more to seed the ground for Trump than just about anybody. Could you talk about that a little bit? Mm -hmm. So Roger Ailes' style of politics was bare knuckled, unapologetic, no apologies, he had this uh, this quote, famous quote from Teddy Roosevelt about, uh, and I'll mangle it, but it's like, you know, the, the man in the arena is the, the one worthy of, uh, the, the, the most worthiest man is the man in the arena with the blood and the sweat on his face or some, something to that effect. Um, and, and that was his vision for politics and how you could put politics on television in a compelling way. And that's exactly what he did. It was, it was except for uh, the, the arena was more American gladiators uh style and anything else and he saw he, it's interesting what, what he didn't see actually what he didn't see that in people like Mitt Romney and it drove him crazy and he this is why he hated Romney and he thought Romney would be a terrible terrible Republican nominee in 2012 and if this you know it shows how similar Roger and Trump were um he, he complained that you know if, if, if Mitt was going to win I was going to be, Roger was going to be the one to do it. I'm going to drag him over the finish line. Now, just like Trump is taking credit for all these Republicans. Like I'm the one who to, he, he used to uh, try, try to toughen these people up as Ben Ginsburg, one of Romney's lawyers said to me, um, Roger thought it was his job to toughen mid up through the debate. So they threw all these like really, really tough questions at him. Uh, and that's why Mitt didn't do very well in the debates and why somebody like Gingrich, who was one of Ailes's favorites, did really well because he was the guy in the arena who voters saw 
as that combatant, the, the guy who would rip the other guy's face off. And that's what Republican primary voters wanted because they wanted to see somebody do that to Obama. And Ailes wanted that done to Obama because Ailes just, just didn't trust Obama, didn't think he was really an American even. Um, but, you know, that, so who does that sound like, right? Like they were, Trump is not only, you know, a, a Fox character, he is a Fox consumer, the ultimate Fox viewer. Like they, it's like, like to, his pollster Tony Fabricio calls him, he's like Archie Bunker with money. Um, and that was Roger Ailes too. You know, you, 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 um, you remind me of the Obama line um, that, that Ailes, in your book, you say that he was un, really incapable of fathoming that Obama had gotten where he had gotten so quickly, right? That it, on, his, on his own merits, that he thought it had to be corrupt. Um, you know, we know obviously that, that accusations of sexual harassment, lawsuits ended Ailes's career, but do you also think that he was a racist? Oh, I, yes, in, this, in, the, in the way that like a lot of those people who grew up in that era um, still really it, like talked about minorities insensitively and, and were suspicious of their motives and their work ethic. Um, yeah, absolutely. And he um, famously, that on the day that, that Glenn Beck, uh, as, as I, I point out in the book, um, on the day that Glenn Beck called Obama a racist, uh, Ailes, while he thought it went too far on for something to put on the air, he told executives at Fox that, that he thought Obama was actually a racist. Um, so yes, his, I mean, his, his views of race were like very much centered in 1960s Ohio, you know, working class blue collar Ohio. Um, so, you know, you do the math, but it's, it's, uh, he certainly, um, it was, it was funny because as somebody pointed out to me, there were, and a lot of people don't know this, but he had a relationship with Jesse Jackson and he actually hired Jesse Jackson's daughter to do work for Fox. And he was, he was friendly with Al Sharpton. Um, but as somebody told me for the book, and I quote this in the book, those were the kinds of African-American leaders that, that, that Ailes could contemplate their success, right? He, he could get his head around that um, because uh, he, he knew them. But like some, you know, he did work with them. He, they were transactional people like he was. But with Obama, as my, as my source in the book says, Rails thought, oh, somebody has to be putting up the money, or he he can't be really who he says he is. Valerie Jarrett has to be pulling the strings, or someone else. Um, and it was, it was a very like condescending and patronizing view of somebody who was obviously bright enough and talented enough to become president. Right, right. Um, just moving on to some other Fox personalities um, or Fox adjacent ones. In your telling, there's a great anecdote about Sean Hannity that paints him to be a big coward, um, where somebody from Breitbart basically bullies him into backing down over the whole Roy Moore um, uh, incident uh, or episode. Rush Limbaugh um, undermines his listeners' faith in institutions. You write about that really powerfully. But I wanted to ask you about Steve Bannon. Uh, my question is really, is it all just a big game to him? Because in your book, you write that Bannon, I'll, I'll quote, found a way to look past his private doubts about Trump's seriousness and competence because he thought the president was the only political figure capable of uniting the fractious populist insurgency on the right, that Bannon believed he could control himself one day. That was interesting to me. Elsewhere, you, you note that Bannon admired Hitler's stagecraft and compared Trump's launch of his campaign with that famous ride down the escalator to the propaganda films of Lenny Reifenstahl. Jeremy, does Steve Bannon want to take over the world? <laughs> yeah, he, he would. I don't, you know, in his in his mind, uh, yes, that's where he belongs, but I don't see it happening. Um, when when Trump was, uh, when after Trump fired him, um, he was, you know, obviously full of anger and bitterness, and talked about even primarying Trump, which is kind of uh, kind of absurd. But I think that for the moment, what he what he realizes, because he's remember Bannon was somebody, as the book lays out, who saw a real spark in Sarah Palin, and he tried to get her to run for president in 2011. 
Um, so Bannon is is always looking for these figures who he can help steer, right? Because he gives them, you know, the the, the famous idea, idea that um, Rove was Bush's brain, right? Well, like I always say that Bannon was Trump's translator because like, he gives them this vocabulary and this kind of intellectual architecture. He did the same for Palin because, you know, I mean, and this is not an insult to their intelligence, but like, you know, Palin and Trump are not like steeped in biographies about William Jennings Bryant, right? I mean, they, they, Amer populism is not a really, and there's a funny anecdote in the, in the book about that, about what Trump says when, when Bannon tells him for the first time about American populism and Trump says, yeah, a popularist, popularist, popularistism, that's, like, that's what I am. So you know, Bannon it could he identified the historical trends and the kind of power of political issues in that moment uh, that could motivate voters to support someone like a Palin or or Trump, and he gives them though he gives them the 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 template from which to build a campaign to run on, right? Um, so I think, yeah, it, it, that's what he's doing from the sidelines on, with, with this podcast now too. Is, is really what, do you th what do you think from having written about him and talked to him and interviewed him about and, and just, you know, watched, watched him for this book and, and beyond, what, what was he looking to accomplish? Political domination. I mean, he has, it, it, he has these these fantasies, and I, I don't think this will ever bear out just because like the ugliness of of the the right um, is it's just so visceral and such a such a so offensive to so many people that you could never. Bannon wanted to construct like a a a left right political coalition where where the like the Bernie people would unite with the Trump people, and that would be a majority. But the problem is, is they they just haven't excised the anti-immigrant, anti-black uh, sentiment, you know, the people even said that the, 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 that's enough. Um, you know, we don't need you, we don't want you. Um, but that's, I think in his, you know, it, in his, the political theory part of his brain, that's what he would say he's trying to do. But he's also, a, like Trump, fascinated with show business. I mean, you pointed out the Leni Riefenstahl uh, propaganda and he sees Trump and you know, he's a, so he, he studies this stuff very carefully and understands the power that the media has to manipulate people. And so part of him, while he, you know, he, he knows that Trump has all these flaws and he doesn't trust Trump's judgment on a lot of things and thinks that Trump has squandered a lot of opportunities, he sees a kind of raw uh, in, intuition in Trump that you can't, you can't teach and you can't, it, like Trump didn't sit down and watch Triumph of the Will. Um, but he some he knew that he, he he just he understood the power of of images um, in the same way that 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 Bannon does. But Bannon studied it, and for Trump, I think it was just more of a is an, of an instinct. So um, we've touched on maybe one or two, but there's a lot of episodes in the book that are kind of canary in the coal mine stories about um, you know things that happened on the right years ago that that you know, they're, they're the steps on the, on the road pointing straight to somebody like Trump taking over the, uh, over the GOP. What, what are some of your favorites? So the one that I like the most that I, I hope will, that people will, especially in, in our area, uh, will remember well is, uh, remember well, but, hope, but, but probably not remember all the details of Trump's involvement, the extent of his involvement is the, the Ground Zero Mosque or what they call the Ground Zero Mosque. And as I re-reported that story, so I was having lunch with one of Trump's former advisors, who one of the many who'd been fired. Um, and uh, this, he was telling me the story of how Trump got involved in the Ground Zero Mosque. And I, I had no memory of it, even though I covered that story as a media story uh, 12 years ago, because this was the summer of 2010, the, the, you know, the eruption of the Tea Party. Um, and what I discovered, was that you know not only was Trump involved in that because of course he offered to buy the land so the uh, the developers couldn't build this this mosque even though it wasn't really a mosque it was a community center that was Islamic just like there's a JCC or a YMCA um, this was the you know, a Muslim vision for that but Trump 
saw, and I asked him about this when I interviewed him, I said, why were you drawn to this as an issue? And it, because it was a popularist issue, he, he saw that it wasn't a popular thing that, you know, despite Bloomberg's support for it, Obama's support for it, the polls showed that most people didn't want it built so close to ground zero. So Trump latched onto that, but so did other people at the time who didn't really know Trump. Bannon is one of them, and Bannon only met Trump that summer on a completely unrelated thing. Dave Bossy, uh, who ended up being the deputy campaign manager and a, and a, a strategic advisor to Trump. Um, you had Robert Mercer, who ended up giving one being one of Trump's biggest donors. He funded a campaign, uh, an advertising campaign to stop it. You had Roger Stone, and I could go on and on and on. But all these people, and they weren't working together for the most part. They were all working against this issue without having much interact, any interaction with each other. So I found it to just be such a, a fascinating way to show that all of these elements were there, not only all of these elements, but the people, it was the same characters and they would converge five years later under the Donald Trump umbrella. It's the most amazing foreshadowing. I mean, you know, uh, I also, can, I, can I just ask you in re-reporting that, like, did, was there, were there one or two things besides the collection of characters that we now know, it's like footnotes on every one of them, yeah. right? But, um, you, you know, is there, was there anything in particular that you learned in re-reporting that, that you, you think was just like mind blowing that, that had it come out at the time would have really reshaped the coverage or? So, yeah, I think, and I don't know that, it, it, that this could have come out at the time because I don't know that the uh, uh, the person involved had the realization until later. But it was Rick Lazio who was running for governor of New York at the time and in the Republican primary. And of course he lost uh, because he wasn't angry enough. He was like a Mitt Romney. He wouldn't rip the other guy's face off. But he tried to get involved in the Ground Zero Mosque and went to a hearing for the Landmarks Commission and testified against it. Uh, and I interviewed him for the book and he and he said to me, he was like at that meeting, I could hear the boos and and you know see this you know the ugliness of some of the signs that were just anti-Muslim. It was like pure anti-Muslim venom. It wasn't anything else. Uh, it wasn't NIMBY sentiment. It was just pure anti-Islamic stuff. And um, he told me that he he really regretted it. That, that like that was a point where he knew that this had gone too far uh, and that something dark was being unleashed. And, you know, who knows if he had spoken up and said that he, he I, I bet it, he probably really would have lost the primary by an even bigger margin. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I don't know if they were throwing around Rhino then, but yeah, right. Um, yeah. Um, so um, let, let's let you, you mentioned evangelicals at the start, and I wanted to just go back to that because it's 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 a huge um, chunk of Trump's base. And um, you 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 spend quite a bit of time um, talking about his relationship. It, it, there's a chapter called "Give Them What They Want," and that's a quote from Trump. Can can you talk about uh, um, about that and uh, tell the story of that quote and and what it means? Right. Well, it's you know it, it's kind of an echo of, of of the second half of the subtitle um, and how they got everything they ever wanted. So that was a scene um, early on in the Trump uh, White House, or maybe it was a transition. Um, when Trump turns to one of Mike Pence's advisors and he's insecure about his relationship with evangelicals at this point. He's not sure that they're fully on board with him. That's not his world, obviously. Uh, so he doesn't really know what to think of them or what they think of him. And he says to Pence's chief of staff, you know what, I'm just gonna give them whatever they want. So they keep coming back. And that was, one of the cornerstone principles of his presidency. Like he did almost everything with the exception of like one or two things that I can think of that evangelicals and, and social conservatives and the religious right pressed him to do. I mean, the, the, the embassy in Jerusalem, that was, oh, that was a big checklist uh, item for the religious right. And it ended up being on all their lists of accomplishments that Donald Trump had achieved for them. Um, and he was somebody who was so transactional that he, he didn't care about the ideology of it, right? Like he doesn't care where the embassy in Israel is. It just, it, it, it fulfilled a, I think part of him kind of liked the, 
the fact that no no other president had dared to do it because it was so explosive, as you know, David, because you were there and you, like you covered it, and uh, it, it was a very disruptive thing. Um, and he liked that, but be, there was nothing particularly ideological. It was purely transactional, and that was, I think, a revelation for me in talking to the people on the religious right who came around to Trump and seeing how transactional they could be. And I think it also surprised some of them because for them, Mike Pence was the kind of politician who was their model. Mike Pence was the guy who'd been married to his wife for 30 years. He was the guy who could recite the Bible chapter and verse. Um, it goes to church every Sunday. And that's like Rick Santorum, Gary Bauer, and on and on, uh, the social conservatives who, who dazzled the right. But Trump did more for them than any of those candidates, any of those politicians. And I think they figured that out. And it, other evangelicals uh, who are anti-Trump have commented on this phenomenon as well, but it, it, it needs to be said that some of them also didn't just look past Trump's boorish behavior and, and, his ugly, and the ugliness uh, and the mean-spiritedness. They embraced it, they liked it. They, as, as somebody said to me, Trump may be a bully. This is an evangelical woman. Um, Trump may be a bully, but he's our bully. So they liked, uh, Pete Weiner has written a lot about this. He doesn't even want to call himself an evangelical anymore. He used to write for George W. Bush. Um, but he says, you know, that he thinks a lot of evangelicals just liked the mean spiritedness of it. And you saw that. Um, in, I mean, do you, you probably remember this, David in 2015 when Trump went to go speak at uh, that event with Frank Luntz and he said John McCain isn't a war hero I like war heroes who weren't captured that was an evangelical event and people in the audience laughed right um I I, I wanted to ask you also about um this dynamic um that you write about really really well about how Trump can really kind of just change people's opinions on things, like almost on a dime, right? Um, and I wonder in particular with evangelicals, whether there are, whether you've ever seen any limits on that, any, you know, but can you talk about that dynamic and just for our, our viewers kind of spin that out a little bit? Right. I, I do wonder like, was there ever like a breaking point there? So I thought January 6th would be it, but it really wasn't. You know, I thought that maybe initially it was. I Because I, I remember talking to evangelical leaders uh, in the days and weeks after the attack, and uh, they, were sh they were shaken, just like Kevin McCarthy was shaken. But then, you know, they kind of quickly forgot about that. Um, and but there's, but there's two things. There's like, you know, people who kind of come in line, fall in line, right? Because of political pressure and they want to continue to be po political, right? And successful. And then there's actually changing people's beliefs on issues. And that's, mm -hmm. that, that, that's what I'm, that's the one I'm getting at, you know? like right. No, that's a, that's a good point because that's the, that's a phenomenon that is like, it's quantifiable. Like pollsters have, have looked at this, including Trump's own pollsters who have, uh, who as Tony Fabricio told me, um, he told Trump about vaccines and the coronavirus, or no, there were no vaccines, yet, but it was coronavirus and masks and all that. Like he, Tony told Trump, you're the Pied Piper. You know, the, your voters will follow whatever tune you are playing. And that was borne out in data that people were seeing in 2016 when Trump started cozying up to Putin. Guess what? There were fewer far fewer Republicans who, who said that they thought Russia was America's enemy. I mean, that is mind blowing. This is the Republican Party, the evil empire, the Ronald Reagan Republican Party. And, and more Republicans were saying that they thought that Russia wasn't a real threat to the United States. And that was all Trump. He also did that with trade and immigration. They, people have uh, Republican voters, the electorate at large, um, not so much the, you know, the elite leadership, but or the thought leadership, but they have come around. The immigration is bad. Trade, free trade policies hurt American jobs. That was, the, the, that was unthinkable in the Republican Party of George H.W. and W. Bush. And, and, are, and was there or is there, I mean, maybe we're seeing glimmers of this with vaccines where, you know, he's lost control. 
but were there was there ever a point at which you know the base kind of didn't go along with it vaccines is is the is the one that comes to mind right now and that's the one if you talk to people on the right uh that he's he could be the most vulnerable on um because that has taken off in a way that i mean just look at what's happening in canada with these protests it's 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 so so powerful and people are so convinced that this is just a mortal because it's i i don't want to psychoanalyze why but it's such an affront it's so personal um i and 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 you combine that with a you know our toxic political culture and people it's it's exploded in a way that i has surprised me um and it surprised trump because <laughs> he certainly wasn't expecting to get booed like he did when he brought up the vaccines at a rally a couple months ago uh, mm -hmm. because o'reilly told him to do it um uh, because it is a, a success of his administration, like that he Operation Warp Speed was was his, um, and he felt like, of course, he wasn't getting enough credit for it because Biden was getting credit, and he, so he tried to take credit. Um, but yeah, I, I would say though, getting back to your question, there's something different about like the trade and immigration um, flip switch that voters made because I think like what Trump did there wasn't so much like make them change their minds on it um and they're like kind of blindly following him like a pie piper um what the, what he pointed out there i think was that the republican orthodoxy from on high was actually harming uh american workers and that they ought to rethink this um and, and most people hadn't given it that much thought it was just kind of like oh yes you cut taxes you, you know you allow companies to make a lot of money and that's good for the economy overall but uh, yeah. Right. I want to ask one or two more questions, but I just want to remind the folks watching or listening um, that there's a Q and A, I think, button somewhere on your screen. If you want to put in some questions, we've only had a couple so far, um, but we don't want to miss this opportunity. Um, so um, let me just ask you this. It, it, and this is, you know, putting on your unaccustomed prognostication cap. Um, but is the Trump base here to stay? And 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 what I what I mean is, is it transferable to another Republican? You know, if Donald Trump were to eat one too many cheeseburgers, um, would a Marjorie Taylor Greene or a Matt, Matt Gates or Mike Pompeo or someone else be able to exert the same kind of hold on these masses who have so closely, almost religiously, I think religiously in some cases, followed Donald Trump? Yeah, I think not. Uh, it's hard for me to imagine. There has been no figure in, in modern political history in America um, who, whose followers print flags with his name on it and T-shirts with his images of, of him as Rambo and his face superimposed over Rambo's uh, muscular body and t brandishing a machine gun. I mean, it's it's he's so singular. I think that that like Matt Gates is not going to be able to replicate that uh and i think that his you know it, it's it's just his his connection to his voters combined with his savvy of the media uh, and, and his use of the media um it's it's just something that i don't think you can replicate i'm gonna like cheat here and steal an answer from pat buchanan when I asked him why Trump was the only one who had been able to do this when you, Pat, had you know run on these issues uh, a decade ago, de decade or two ago. And he said that he thinks Trump is the indispensable man. And I think that's, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think that if, you know, Ron DeSantis could, yeah, all these guys could pick up chunks of that, but Trump is, it doesn't mean that Trump is, that Trump is the is, is is still that singular of a force and has still that much hold over his base because you know if you look at the polls and the and and, and the way people have responded to him about vaccines there's certainly been some slippage and I think that that is ultimately the story of my book Insurgency like the GOP it, its modern history has been about overthrows and revolts from within that that are destabilizing to the party leadership and Trump is the party leadership. And if history is any guide, there are elements of the party that that 
the leadership has co-opted or tried to co-opt and it's come around and bit them because it's not controllable. Those, those people, Marjorie Taylor Greene is not gonna be controlled. She's not gonna be co-opted. Um, and I think that's what's dangerous to Trump that he's not invulnerable to the same forces that have undone previous Republican leaders. So let's take a few um, reader questions now. Uh, one of our neighbors here writes, um, since so many establishment Republicans still vote for today's far right GOP, no matter how extreme, were they ever really establishment figures to begin with? I mean, I think that they've changed um, their tolerance for um, ugliness and, and hostility and um, just the, the, the lowering the bar in for what's acceptable political discourse. Uh, so I think you get, yeah, you, you look, I spent a lot of time talking to people who were um, the types that you would think maybe have some misgivings about an, an event like January 6th. And they did. And, you know, I asked them afterwards, was this all worth it? And they said, yes, you know, it, it was despite, you know, I take the bitter with the sweet. Um, we had, a, we had a good run with them and there were, you know, sure there was some bad stuff. It's, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of extraordinary. The, the ability to whitewash um, or, you know, hold, hold their nose at, at a lot of his, a lot of his record. Um, so that's the, like, that's the party. Mm -hmm. um, another reader asks, um, or viewer, I should say, habits. Um, it seems that McConnell genuinely understands that Trump is a real threat to democracy. Given that, why didn't he get rid of Trump forever when he had the chance in the second impeachment? Because he didn't have the votes his conference wouldn't have gone along with it. The, the, the votes were not there. There was no way that uh, um, even McConnell, I think ever would have voted to convict Trump because Trump is the source from which the Republican party's political power flows. They're afraid of him. And until the voters tell them otherwise, until the voters toss out Trump, uh, he's gonna be there because there's gonna be no Republican to stand up and say, I mean, there will be, there'll be like Liz Cheney's and Adam Kinzinger's, but you know, those, they're essentially, I mean, for all intents and purposes, they're essentially Democrats now. And, and another follow-up on, on McConnell, uh, someone asks, how do you think the pushback from him uh, about January 6th is gonna play out such as it is that pushback? The pushback against McConnell, I'm sorry. No, the pushback the by McConnell. Oh, how do I think the pushback is gonna You know, play? what we're seeing now, you know, about the censure and so on. So I'll, I'll preface this by saying, like, I don't want to make it sound like, as, as I said in one of my previous answers, I don't think Trump is invulnerable. I don't think he's, I don't think that people see him as like, as infallible as, as they used to. I think there is something that um, is wearing a little thin about his act, although like he hasn't been on the stage as much. So I don't know what it looks like when he is once again at the center of our political universe in our news cycle. Um, you know, that said, I've read enough of these National Review editorials and Wall Street Journal op-eds and heard enough denunciations uh, by Romney and McConnell from the Senate floor to know where this is probably heading. And that's with Trump turning this around to his advantage. Uh, and I think that what you started to see in the last few days, uh, because and we didn't even get into this, but a big part of the book is about the creation of this alternate reality and how that was sustained over the years and, and, and expanded in the Trump years. Um, I checked yesterday just out of curiosity, how is the McConnell statement playing? How is the RNC resolution playing in conservative media? Almost none. It's... It, it's it's a very while while it was our biggest story one of our biggest stories while it was all on cable news um, with the exception of Fox News just wasn't a big story the way it's getting covered now this is what I was getting at, is people are starting to use this pro Trump people are starting to use this as a way to go after McConnell to 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 rally circle the wagons say 
this is McConnell is coming for Trump. They have a plan. They're going to try to take him out again. And they're trying to recreate this, you know, Trump, the outsider under attack from from above um, the, 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 that kind of narrative that you had in 2016. I don't know if it works as well this time. Uh, and I wouldn't try to, to, to pretend like I, I do um, because there's just too much, uh, too much we don't know about how things are going to shake out. Let me just jump in and ask you to say a little bit more about the creation of the alternate alternate reality, or, or, or alternative reality, um, uh, because I think it's important. And and what maybe as a follow up to that, what do people who don't consume that media need to understand about it that they may not? I mean, it's a, it's a it's like a it's like a, t a tr uh, tribe or a team you know you're putting on a jersey like when, like when you consume this stuff you feel like you're part of a of a community um a, and a community that's very good at telling its audience that they're under constant siege and that they are the victims of a of a system that is systemically unfair to conservatives and you know of course the irony is that conservatives conservatives have built you know, one of the most powerful and effective uh, media apparatuses, like in in, in modern times and in, in in civilization. I mean, it's it's they, they say that the mainstream media, the New York Times. I mean, Sarah Palin suing the New York Times. Part of her argument today was very interesting. Listen, it's it, you know, she called us um, Goliath, and she, you know, she was David looking for her stones to throw. No, like that's that that's not the the position of the, the conservatives are in anymore because they have this. This megaphone, it's, it's to say it's diffuse is the wrong word because it's just, it's powerful because there are many, many little entities uh, that you may not have ever heard of. Radio hosts, little websites, um, social media networks that, we're, that you're just not on, but they all work in concert and they talk to each other and they're so disciplined at driving a message. And this is why, um, you know, he's Hannity is such an interesting figure because people who study him notice his use of repetition as a classic propaganda technique. And during the Trump impeachment, his ability to create an alternate narrative about what had really happened in Ukraine and and who the real enemies were, what ended up being the the, the line that Trump's defenders used in Congress. So it's they're very message disciplined um, in a way that the, that the left is just not because it doesn't have anything approaching uh, what the right has with media. Yeah, the, I mean, the only person who I can think of who uses repetition more effectively is Trump himself. Yeah. Um, so there's another reader question. Uh, what do the Democrats have to do to beat Trump next time, assuming he does run? Not being Trump wasn't enough in Virginia for Terry McAuliffe against Glenn Youngkin. The Republicans will win the culture wars. Biden can't pass Build Back Better. The Democrats are losing working class voters, even minorities. Can they get it together to beat the indispensable man? I mean, it at, at this moment, it certainly doesn't look good. But I would say that Trump is always his own worst enemy, right? He lost in 2020 because he couldn't get out of his own way. He refuses to let go this notion that he was victimized in 2020, that it was stolen from him. And if he isn't able to suppress the crazy talk about the election, I think that's Democrats' best weapon against him. It's like, you know, Biden won because there was this fatigue you know, for, I think he captured it best in that debate where he said, oh, would you just shut up, man? And people laughed all across, you know, it's, it was true. People were just sick of Trump. Like, and it, actually this is a, another quote from Steve Bannon, which like shows you that he's like how, how aware he is of all of Trump's flaws um, and yet still you know, continues to enable him. But he said, Trump is like the TV, the bad TV show that you can't cut off. <laughs> And it's true. I mean, I remember we <laughs> came. It was like in uh, 2018 or something. And you know, he used to stand in front of the helicopter, and the helicopter's whirring, and he's shouting um, because he liked that. He liked shouting, and he liked that the, that he could pretend not to hear the reporters' questions when they asked him um, because of the rotors. 
And uh, it, it, I remember um, the, somebody, we were watching it and it said like, oh God, would he just stop? Like, leave us alone. And so there is like a certain sense that people remember the absurdity and the exhaustion, especially of those four years. So I wouldn't say that all hope is lost for Democrats by any stretch of the imagination because Trump has shown time and time again how self-destructive he is. Um, one question I wanted to ask you uh, from another uh, one of our readers is, it, it, it seems that Biden didn't win the election, but that Trump lost it. Is it possible, do you think that is, that the more Trump takes center stage, the more voters he'll alienate and that linkage to Trump will prove to be a disadvantage for them? I think so, but the linkage to Trump is only relevant in such a small handful of states and, and congressional races because there's so, what is it now, a dozen? It used to be, 65, 70 or something a decade ago of these uh, these districts, house districts, where the member was of a different party um, than the president. So like a, a Trump district represented by a Democrat, say, or, or um, you know, an Obama district represented by a Republican. There's now a dozen. So, you know, th th they'll only get so far tying Trump tying other Republicans to Trump um, just because Trump is so overwhelmingly popular in a lot of these red districts. But uh, I think that, you know, it's, 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 it's a good question because Trump, as I said, can't get out of his own way, but the Democrats need to figure out a way to go back and highlight and convince voters of what was Biden's biggest strength. And that's his competence, right? Like his entire argument was it wasn't just like I'll return things to normalcy. I'm competent, and this guy's not. This guy is a disaster. He can't like look at what he's done to our country. Um, and it's true. Like I think like that Trump's competence. Um, I don't know how that looks now because Biden's competence has suffered so much, and Trump's people have been salivating over the fact that whether it's Afghanistan or inflation, uh, the supply chain issues, that, that, that Biden just looks like he doesn't have control. And he also looks at control of, of, of the levers of government um, and the economy, but also control of his own party as a leader, as a leader that people respect and, and, and follow. So they need to reestablish some of that, um, I think, in, in order to be on a better footing. Another reader asks, um, or viewer, sorry, We've seen a lot of Trump television interviews over the years. What was he like for you to interview compared to other politicians? And how did you approach your discussions with him? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, because people often ask, like, what's he like? And I got to say, he's pretty much the same as you see on TV, except for he swears more. And he'll occasionally go off the record and tell a dirty joke. Uh, but he's, he, he can be a very charming guy. He can be very funny and he tells he tells good stories, but he's also somebody who, when you speak to him, you have to be very strategic as a journalist. I mean, you have to be very strategic about what questions you're going to ask and, and, and identify your goal of what you want to get out of him. So when the first time I interviewed him for this book was about a year ago, and I made it a point not to ask any questions that I thought might elicit a, a, some type of response about voter fraud or the election. And it didn't always work, but for the most part, our interview stayed away from that. I didn't get, I didn't want to get to that kind of stuff until the second part of the interview. Um, because otherwise he just, he go, it's, it's like you see on TV, but, but with more swear words, he goes into these rants, these digressions about the people who have wronged him and the people who have been ungrateful to him, who's, who owe their careers to him and his political brilliance and, and acumen. Um, and that's, that's what a conversation with him is like. It's, it's a lot of uh, superlative, a lot of, I did this, I was the first to, uh, it's, I, I hate to disappoint, but it really is. It really is what you see um, in one of those extended interviews on on Fox and Friends. Here's another like uh, <clears throat> uh, future uh, predicting question. Some people believe that a third party might be an option, just as the Republican Party 
displaced the Whigs in the 1800s. Do you think a third party could displace the Republicans and eventually become a major party? Is this my dad? Um, it could be. I, th I think this sounds like a question that he would ask. And I think he tried to ask it the other night. <laughs> the moderator was like, nope, we're not talking the about The ringer. That. Yes, I did recognize the last name. <laughs> um, Maybe you so want to answer this one once and for all? <laughs> well, it's, I mean, right, because the, the, the Whigs went into oblivion. Um, and I think that there's an argument to be made that unless the never Trump people find a way to work with the Democrats, that they're just going to be shouting into the void, mm -hmm. right? Um, there's a guy who's running in Utah. He wants to run for Senate um, and he's a Republican and he ran, uh, this guy, Evan McMullen, and he ran for president last time in 2016. But his, his whole thing now is how to figure out a way to get the Democrats to trust him to nominate him because most democratic primaries, uh, those voters are not gonna wanna nominate somebody who's, who just switched his registration from Republican. So yeah, there's, the, unless they figure that out, um, you know, the, the I don't know that a third party is, it would really, that's, that's why these guys like Bill Kristol have formed these committees where they're encouraging Republicans to vote Democrat, right? Like Rahm Emanuel coined the famous phrase, Biden Republican, like Reagan Democrat. And that's that's why, but like to the uh, to the other questioner, um, who asked about uh, you know the, the uh, whether or not there could be a, a some kind of like synergy there, it's I think that Biden is uh, he did he did win because Trump lost, right? I mean, your, the question was did did Biden re did Biden really win or did Trump lose? It's kind of the same situation as in 2016 when Hillary lost. Uh, Trump didn't really win. We're getting some comments now, but I, I want to just keep it to questions. Um, so just going back to insurgency, your title, um, someone asks, you know, what you estimate are the chances that Ron DeSantis could lead the next phase of the insurgency. But I would just widen that aperture and ask you, you know, is, is there the next insurgent on the stage yet or on the horizon? Well, I think that, and I don't know what we'll see in terms of, of her capabilities to lead a national coalition, but Marjorie Taylor Greene to me has a lot of the same qualities as, uh, as Sarah Palin. You know, she really does command an audience and people seem to like this. I mean, I've seen her speak at rallies and she's, she's quite effective at, at whipping the crowd up. Um, I don't know what becomes of that. I don't, I, it, it all depends on Trump, right? Because as Trump's advisors will say, his effectiveness is not so much in his endorsements. Those are fine. Um, people like to put that on flyers and they, they can raise money, but he's effective when he attacks you, another Republican. And he will attack Ron DeSantis if Ron DeSantis uh, makes a move against him. And Ron DeSantis knows this and that's why he's staying quiet. Um, the la it, look what he did uh, to Lion Ted and Little Marco. Now, is he as effective as that at that as he used to be? With the signs showing that his, you know, he's kind of slipping. Um, I, I don't know, but I think we should all remember that that is his secret weapon: his his ability to just humiliate his rivals. Yeah, this reminds me of another great. Um passage in the book about the fourth stool, a stool, the fourth leg of the stool. Sorry, I'm botching it. But um, why don't you just describe what that is? Because I, I, I wanted to ask you why the Democrats have never kind of added that, you know, leg to their stool. But why tell people what we're talking about. Yeah, so there's a Republican strategist, and this will be the backstory is, is pretty funny. And it shows you how much the Republican Party truly has become Trump's the strategist worked for Brian Kemp um, of Georgia governor fame, who uh, declared that Trump had lost, which in fact happened. Uh, and Brian Kemp was running in a tough Republican primary for governor in 2018. And this Republican strategist I interviewed, a really bright guy, um, was the one who made these ads for Brian Kemp. And Brian Kemp ran as a full Trump Republican in the primary. Uh, ad with a pickup truck and he said standing in front of his pickup truck I'm going to drive this baby around the state and round me up some illegals 
and he won. He won the primary on the, the, the strength of his Trump impersonation. Well, this, this strategist was telling me that the, that episode was, it, it really illustrated how Republicans have turned to what he called stylistic conservatism. It's about attitude um, more than it is about any policy or, or, or ideology. And so there's this famous Republican proverbial stool that had three legs, they always used to say, fiscal conservatives, social conservatives, and military hawks. And that was the Republican Party of Ronald Reagan that he built. Well, this strategist identified a fourth leg, he said, that he called the stylistic leg. And that's really the one I think that is holding up the Republican Party today. Yeah, the other ones have actually gotten somewhat rickety um, uh, to some degree, depending on who we're talking about. But, um, mm -hmm. but, but is there, is, is, is it totally irrelevant to Democrats, that stylistic, stylistic aspect of politics? Um, you know, uh, is there a way that there, there you know, there could be a, a corollary, a, a corollary for Democrats that might have, you know, broader appeal. I just wonder. It it doesn't seem like we've seen that. It doesn't seem like there's a person who's good at it yet, right? Um, and that's what it would take because I think a lot of these guys who try to fake being Trump are really bad at it. Mm -hmm. um, so you'd have to have some. It's a, and you've seen this argue. A lot of Democrats make this argument in recent weeks, and it's not new. Like. Philippe Reigns um, was making this case in 2018. You know, Hillary's uh, a top, one of Hillary's top guys was saying, you know, you need, Biden needs to go there. And uh, remember Biden said something like, I'd like to take Trump out and encourage him to a, a fist fight behind the, you know, the schoolyard or whatever. Um, and it didn't quite work for Biden, but you have to have somebody who can do it well um, or else they just look dumb. Listen, you've been great. Um, the book you. is terrific. Uh, your you. answers have been really thoughtful. Um, I encourage everybody to pick up a copy. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you for your time and thank the Montclair Library for hosting us. No, oh, thank you, David. And thank you. Jeremy and David, thank you so much for coming to Open Book, Open Mind for this illuminating, important, and frequently alarming discussion. Um, and thanks to all the viewers for coming and tuning in today and for all your excellent questions. And as I always say, without you, we're nothing. And um, I just want to remind everybody that Insurgency is available for sale by our partner, Watch on Booksellers in Montclair, and that it will soon be available to borrow through the library. And this is the part of the uh, program where I just remind you that if you want books like this to keep being written and you want uh, writers like Jeremy Peters to come back to Open Book, Open Mind, and if you want to support this kind of journalism, that you'll consider buying the book and that there's no greater um, compliment to an author than to actually buy the book and to own a copy of the book. Um, so, uh, and finally, we hope that you'll join us for our next event on Thursday, March 10th at 7 p.m. We'll be ho hosting Patrick Radden Keefe, a staff writer for The New Yorker, in conversation about his longtime New York Times bestseller, Empire of Pain, The Secret History of the Sackler Dynasty. Be well, and we hope to see you next time. Thanks so much.